Today is Pearl Harbor Day, the anniversary of the Japanese attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet that President Franklin Roosevelt called a date which will live in infamy. Among the many stories of heroism on this day is one of a small, outdated vessel crewed by naval reservists that played a unique role in the Second World War and the attack on Pearl Harbor. This scrappy vessel demonstrated the spirit of the U.S. Navy and the determination of the nation through two wars and some of the hardest fighting in the history of the Navy. The history of the USS Ward deserves to be remembered. James Harmon Ward had an extraordinary career in the Navy. Appointed a midshipman in 1823, he served aboard Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution in the Atlantic Squadron. Later he served in the blockade of Africa, an operation that cooperated with the British Royal Navy to intercept and stop the West African slave trade. And then in the West Indies, fighting pirates. Because doesn't every great story involve pirates? A naval scholar, Ward taught courses for midshipmen and authored textbooks on naval theory and practice. When in 1845, Secretary of the Navy George Bancroft formed a naval school on the grounds of the former U.S. Army Fort Severn in Annapolis, Maryland, James Harmon Ward was one of the first five founders and the first commandant of midshipmen of what would eventually be called the U.S. Naval Academy. At the advent of the U.S. Civil War, he was given command of the Potomac Squadron. There, in the June 1861 Battle of Matthias Point, he was leading from the front, having brought his flagship, the steamer USS Thomas Freeborn, close to shore to protect a retreating shore party. While sighting the ship's bow gun, Commander Ward was killed by sniper fire. He was the first U.S. naval officer killed fighting in the Civil War, and his name would carry on in the U.S. Navy. The development of the self-propelled torpedo in the 1860s led to a new vessel for naval service, the torpedo boat. These small, cheap, and fast boats could run out and engage large ships with torpedoes and then retreat. The first successful use of such a boat to sink an armored ship with a self-propelled torpedo occurred during the Chilean Civil War of 1891, when the torpedo gunboat Almirante Lynch sank the armored frigate Blanco Encalada in the Battle of Caldera Bay. The development of the torpedo boat then gave rise to another class of vessel, the torpedo boat destroyer whose purpose was to screen larger warships from attacks by torpedo boats and be able to fire torpedoes themselves. The first boat of this type built for the United States was the USS Bainbridge, commissioned in 1903. U.S. Navy destroyer designs evolved quickly. By 1916, when it was increasingly clear that the U.S. may be drawn into the First World War and the Navy was being greatly expanded, the Naval Appropriations Act called for the construction of 50 Wicks-class destroyers vessels with a displacement of 1,154 tons, nearly three times the size of the 420-ton Bainbridge commissioned just 13 years earlier. The submarine threat that became apparent during the Great War gave greater impetus to produce destroyers, and eventually 267 of the Wicks class and the similar Clemson class destroyers were built. One of those was the USS Ward. Designed for high speed and mass production, Wicks class destroyers were larger than previous U.S. designs, largely because of the requirement that they be able to make 35 knots, fast enough to keep up with the Lexington and Omaha class cruisers. The larger design used a single deck that was continuous from stem to stern, differentiating it from previous U.S. destroyer designs that had a raised forecastle. Thus, the Wicks and the closely related Caldwell and Clemson class destroyers were commonly called the flush deck destroyers. They had two boilers and thus four stacks. Armament was four 4-inch 50 caliber guns, 12 21-inch torpedo tubes, a 3-inch 23 caliber anti-aircraft gun, and depth charges. Built at the Mare Island Naval Shipyard near Vallejo, California, the construction of the USS Ward is a testament to the extent of the U.S. mobilization during the First World War. The Navy was emphasizing destroyer production, even delaying the production of cruisers to facilitate more destroyers being built. Under this pressure, the ship's keel for USS Ward was laid May 15, 1918, and she was launched June 1st, marking a U.S. record for the production of a destroyer of only 17 days. Ward was commissioned into service on July 24th, one of only a handful of Wicks-class vessels completed in time to serve during the Great War, and was the flagship of the Destroyer Division 18, but saw no combat. In May of 1919, Ward was part of a famous first, participating in a chain of Navy ships that provided navigational aid and lifeguard station for a U.S. Navy Curtis flying boat, which became the first aircraft of any kind to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, or any of the other oceans for that matter. In 1921, with most of her sister ships, Ward was decommissioned and placed in reserve in San Diego. But in January 1941, with war on the horizon, Ward was recommissioned, manned by reservists of the Minnesota Naval Reserve, which had been called to active duty during the same month. 
Many of the recommissioned ships were sent to the Atlantic to protect convoys, but word was sent to Hawaii, arriving in March. She was assigned, along with three other World War I-era destroyers, to patrol the harbor entrance to Pearl Harbor, where the U.S. Pacific Fleet had been moved. 1941 was a tense year. The U.S. and Japan were at odds over Japanese actions in China and Indochina. The U.S. froze Japanese assets on July 26, 1941, and on August 1st established an embargo on oil and gasoline exports to Japan. While negotiations were ongoing, tensions were high, and in November, the Coastal Patrol was given orders to depth charge suspicious submarine contacts, in essence, permission to shoot, as submarines that entered territorial waters while submerged were not protected by innocent passage protections. On December 5th, Ward got a new commander, Lieutenant William Outerbridge, a 1927 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Ward was his first command, having been executive officer aboard the destroyer USS Cummings. Two days later, Ward was on her routine patrol outside Pearl Harbor around 4 a.m. when she received visual signals via signal light from the Coast Guard manned coastal minesweeper USS Condor. The Condor had a tentative sighting of a periscope. Ward called to general quarters and conducted a search using sonar for the next hour, but turned up no contacts. At 6.40, the general store's issue ship Antares, waiting outside the harbor for a favorable tide, sent another signal about a suspicious object off her stern. Ward's lookout saw, behind the Antares, a small wake, the sign of a periscope, the risk for which they had been warned in November. At first, the watch commander thought it might be a buoy, but decided probably it was a conning tower of a submarine, although the U.S. didn't have anything that looked like that in its navy. The officer on the bridge, Lieutenant Gepner, sent, sent for Captain Outerbridge, who was sleeping in the nearby ready cabin. Outerbridge came to the bridge still wearing his pajamas. By his observation, it looked to be a submarine, apparently intent on following the Antares into Pearl Harbor. Following the order that had been issued in November, Outerbridge ordered an attack, charging the contact. The first shot came from the number one four-inch gun mount, but went long. Then number three gun came to bear, firing a second round. The submarine was so close that the shot was below the gun's targeting reticle. The gunner had to fire by sight alone. The shot seemed to hit the submarine's conning tower, but the crew couldn't be sure. Ward then dropped four depth charges. Outerbridge sent a message to the 14th Naval District Headquarters. He wanted to be clear because he did not want them to mistake the attack as being on just an unidentified sonar contact. We have attacked, fired upon, and dropped depth charges upon submarine operating in defensive sea area, he reported. The message should have been a warning that an enemy attack was imminent, but the message took time to work its way through channels, and command then required confirmation. Another destroyer was sent to help search for contacts, but the Navy did not grasp the significance of the event. Ward saw other sonar contacts and fired more depth charges, but saw no more submarines. They were still outside the harbor when the air attack began. The crew at first thought the explosions they were hearing were from highway work. The submarine the Ward had seen was a Japanese Type A midget submarine, one of five that had been launched from larger submarines some 10 miles from Pearl Harbor on December 6th. The Type A was about 75 feet long, carried two 450mm torpedoes, and had a range of about 100 nautical miles. The question of what the Ward saw and whether it scored a hit was not definitively answered until August of 2002, when researchers from the University of Hawaii finally discovered the wreckage of the submarine, with a clean hole through the conning tower, right where Outerbridge had said the number three gun had hit. Thus, the first shot between the United States and Japan in the Pacific War was fired by the USS Ward. And in the second shot of that war, the Ward had struck home, sunk the Japanese submarine. The first casualties and first vessel loss in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor were Japanese rather than American. USS Ward continued her duties outside Pearl Harbor through the end of the year, but in 1942 was sent to California to be one of 17 Wicks-class vessels to be refitted as high-speed transports. High-speed transports were a new concept. These converted destroyers were designed to be able to disembark troops under fire. Their armament was sufficient to defend themselves from small naval ships and to provide fire support, while they were fast enough to avoid larger ships. Their primary role was to deliver small units, such as marine raiders or army rangers. The flush deck destroyers were a good fit for the role, as removing the second boiler, and consequently two of the four stacks, allowed accommodation for 200 troops, a company-sized unit, while reducing the top speed to 25 knots. The torpedo tubes were removed, allowing room to mount four large landing craft. In addition, Ward's older 4-inch 50 caliber guns were replaced with newer 3-inch 50 caliber anti-aircraft guns. Along with depth charges, the high-speed transport was effective both as an anti-aircraft screen and an anti-submarine role. High-speed transports were given the designation APD, AP meaning transport, 
and D meaning destroyer. The former USS Ward was redesignated APD-16 and was ready for service in February 1943. The work of the fast transports was arduous, combining the roles of transports and destroyers. APD-16 participated in a dizzying array of operations in the Solomon Islands and the invasion of New Guinea. In December 1944, the ship was engaged in landing operations supporting the invasion of the island of Leyte, the beginning of the operation to recapture the Philippines. On a patrol assignment, the APD-16 and the destroyer USS Mahan came under air attack by a group of Japanese G-4M Betty bombers with escort fighters. Three broke off to attack the high-speed transport. Her blazing gun splashed two. The third was hit, but crashed into APD-16 amidships, hitting so hard that one of the plane's two engines continued on through the ship, exiting at the waterline on the starboard side. The bomber exploded, starting uncontrollable fires. The ship came to a stop, her crew attempting to fight the fires, but the hoses had lost pressure. They received assistance from the destroyer USS O'Brien, but as the fires burned towards the fuel and ready ammunition storage, the ship's commander, Lieutenant Raymond Forrest Farwell Jr., had to give the order to abandon ship. Miraculously, only one member of the crew had been injured, and the crew was safely evacuated to other ships. As the fires were beyond control, USS O'Brien was ordered to sink the burning transport with gunfire. In a stunning coincidence, the former USS Ward went under at 11.30 a.m. on December 7th, three years to the day after she fired the first shot of the war in the Pacific. The commander of the USS O'Brien ordered to sink the gallant ship was William Outerbridge, who had commanded her that day outside Pearl Harbor. USS Ward earned one battle star as a destroyer and eight battle stars as a high-speed transport. Her distinguished service and dogged determination well represented the Navy in the Pacific Campaign. Ward's number three, four-inch, 50-caliber gun that fired the second shot and sunk the first enemy vessel of the Pacific War was removed when the ship went in for refit in 1942. In 1958, that gun was installed as a memorial out front the Minnesota State Capitol in St. Paul. The wreckage of the former USS Ward was discovered by the research vessel RV Petrel in December 2017. William Outerbridge continued to serve with the Navy until 1957 when he retired as a Rear Admiral. He passed away in 1986 at the age of 80. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow the History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.